Deep Sea Podcast Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our full-length shows. So if you want to get right to the scientific point, this is the place to be. If you really enjoy the topic and you think, I'd like to know more, just match the episode number and you'll be able to find the full-length episode in our feed. And now, to get right to the point. Natural history collections are immensely important to the scientific community. Since you're listening to this podcast, you're probably interested in science and so have no doubt visited a natural history museum. But the elements that are on display are just the tip of an enormous iceberg. There is a great deal going on behind the scenes. Natural history museums are not just a repository of incredibly valuable specimens. They're also a repository of incredibly valuable people. Talented people, and in my experience, incredibly generous people who will give a great deal of their time and energy to help you with your science. The two people we're talking to on this episode have both in the past put me up for well over a week at a time. They've allowed me to access the collection, they've given me a desk, given me a microscope, and basically been really good company and uh, an excellent guide along the way. And they've done everything they can to aid me in the question I was trying to answer at that time. They're scattered all over the world, and when we collect new samples through our work, once we've done the initial analysis that we need, we always try and deposit them in a natural history museum close to where they were captured, so that the nation's natural heritage is preserved within their institutions as well. These museums form a massive international interconnected network, basically like an interlibrary loan. You can request a specimen, and these museums will move specimens and loan specimens between themselves. So this episode is very much my homage to natural history collections, and they're one of my favorite altruistic elements of of the scientific fraternity. I'm joined by James McLean, Senior Curator of Fishes at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, Thanks for coming on, James. Uh, Thanks, Tom. It's a great honor. The building where I spend most of my time is called the Darwin Centre, and that's where we keep all the pickle things, the things that are usually in alcohol or formalin. But we also have a huge dry collection as well. So a lot of the the early collecting in the early 19th century and earlier than that, they wouldn't wouldn't be able to sort of pickle things in the fields. They would would just dry things out and make them into these sort of skins and bring those back. So a lot of our very early things are just like sort of crispy half fishes. (laughs) Whether we have skeletons as well. So lots of different kinds of preparations. But the bulk of the the collection is uh, in spirit, yeah. We reckon, again, it's a bit of an estimate, but we think we've got about a million fish if you counted every single individual fish in our collection. It'd be something like that. Because, I mean, some jars have got hundreds in them, so it does all add up. It's like being a librarian with dead fish instead of books. So it's not only we look after them, they've all got to be perfectly arranged. And and the, the fundamental bottom line is, can you find what you're looking for? Yeah, it's, it's sort of equal parts care of fragile items, basically, and then their cataloging and their organization. So it, it is a, a meat library, essentially. It is, it is a meat library, yeah. And, and my librarians, we, all, we have to help people to, to use that library. If you've got a good use for a dead fish, if you get in touch, um, we're going to help you out. And it, it doesn't have to be science. I would say that sort of 90% of what I do is to be looking after scientists. But also we have artists. We do a lot of um, things like education. So we provide specimens for exhibitions and we occasionally do things with school groups. And so that's that's a really, that's one of my favorite things to do with our specimens is to do talks and, and presentations. And, and the deep sea stuff just lends itself to so many different opportunities. So for example, a friend was involved with, the, there was a, a feminist festival at South Bank called Women of the World. And she got in touch and said, have you got any sort of animal stories with a feminist slant? I said, oh, yes, I have. <laughs> deep sea delivers. And yeah, so I went along with the, the anglerfish again and said, you know, you've got this big female fish. She's got like um, massive fangs and a light and she sort of goes out there and lives her life. And uh, this tiny little insignificant thing who in some species is so pathetic that if he doesn't find a female, he will die. Um, and then just sort of latches on and just gets absorbed and becomes basically like a little It's organ. just a heat-seeking testicle. It doesn't have any superfluous. It is, yeah. It's not a fully functional animal without the female. No, nostrils and testicles. That's all <laughs> he's got, really, yeah. We got to spend a, a bit of a day wandering the halls. I just felt very welcome and very helped. It was, uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> I love my job so much because you get to experience all these different things. And every time someone like yourself comes in, uh, you get to help them out. You get to take part in a team in, in a little way in something that's really interesting and exciting. But also, it is a two-way street because everybody that comes in and uses our collection almost always imparts some little bit of knowledge. I mean, for you, 
for example, with you, it was the, the pharyngeal teeth of your little um, snailfish. Yes. It looks like a little pink blob. But then when you strip away the flesh, it's got these amazing fucking teeth <laughs> no, in its this throat. cute little fish with this mill in the back of its throat. But it, it, it just a lot of it goes back to what uh, Heather was talking about in the other episode about when you were describing something new. It has to come back to, to specimens because if you want to be absolutely certain that what you are describing is a new thing, you have to find all the things that are similar and then show why your thing mm. is different. And if you can't do that conclusively, your new species isn't really going to stand up. Yeah. Properly. So that, that's one of the most fundamental things we do, really, is for, for new species descriptions. All of the more modern techniques, unless you can tie all that data back to this specimen, it, it loses part of its cohesion, it loses part of its power. It needs to have almost this, this auditing trail, basically. You need to be able to trace all this back to this physical specimen that someone else can look at and say, actually, you were wrong. Well, absolutely. The, the specimen is the sort of the final sort of arbiter of truth, really, because... Uh, going back to DNA, if you have like a, a sequence and you want to see what it is and you go on to GenBank or whatever to compare it with other sequences, those sequences will all come from specimens. And if there's something there that doesn't look quite right, then at the end of the day, you have to go, well, let's go back to the specimen and just check that hasn't been misidentified. And th th this is, I guess, going to bring us on to what type specimens are. So whenever somebody does describe a new species, those specimens that are used in that description are called the types. And there's usually, well, nowadays there's one in particular, which is the, the primary type, which is called the holotype. And quite often you have, if you're lucky enough to get like a whole load of them, you have other ones which are called paratypes. And they then stand as the definitive example of that species. They're called types because they're supposed to be typical of that species. So if there's any debate at all about what that species is, that's what you have to go back to. And if your thing isn't the same as those, then it's not the same species, if that makes I sense. I find the types, I don't know, philosophically quite fascinating because the, the human idea of cataloging and giving names to and structuring the natural world, basically, and then this very physical, very real specimen, it's this weird merging because it, in a very legal sense, that specimen, that physical body represents this scientific name, as we as scientists have, have sort of designated. And I love that merging of the Absolutely. two. It's, it's it, the physical manifestation. Yeah, and it's final. There's no argument about it at all. The type is the type, and that's it. But it isn't always trouble-free, though, because sometimes you will have somebody's got a type series, and there's actually different species within that. That's a bit of a headache. And then you can occasionally have something where there are different species within a type series, and one of those is a new species. So you can have a, a fish that's actually a type of two different species, and you can have types that are just in horrible condition. So we've got some stuff at the museum that's it's very, very old. It's falling to bits. But it's still the type, and it's what you've got to use. Like a lot of things, it's not perfect, but it's the best we've got, I think. <laughs> A lot of those early species descriptions are really vague, and they can be just a couple of sentences. They won't mention a specific specimen. And then you've got to say, well, I have a specimen here, which was in the collection of the person that described the species, and they would have had it at that time. It's possibly <laughs> the type. It's possibly the one they had there, but can't say for sure. And one of the, the things I have to bear in mind every day is that if something isn't certain, I cannot, I've got to be so careful yeah. not making up any new information because I'm just a part in a chain. So the, the Natural History Museum has been going in various forms since like the early 1800s based on collections from even before then. So there's all these people been looking after this stuff and I'm here now and I'm trying to make sense of what they've been doing. And every single thing that I do, every little label that I write, I've got to think, well, somebody's going to be reading that yeah. 150, 200, hopefully, years after I'm dead. And is what I've done going to make sense to them? And if I go, I think this is the type, am I going to give them enough evidence to go, okay, yes, that maybe is, or are they going to go, no, that's rubbish. So it's, it's a really, you've got to show you're working for every little thing that you do. Even if it's, it's screamingly really obvious, if there's even a, a hint of a doubt. And occasionally you'll have a situation where somebody will come in and go, do you have the type of this? And don't know. And you go and have a look in the collection, you rummage around and you find something and you go, okay, well, this is it. And you say, well, you can't say for sure, 
And they go, but it, but it has to be because of this, this. And it's like, that's not enough. Yeah. And you have to say to them, look, you, you cannot call that the type with, with absolute certainty. And it makes some people very unhappy. <laughs> Why can't you just make it simple? But yeah, it's a, it's a huge sense of responsibility, really, to, to sort of think of all those people. Like, you know, you'll write a label and you put it in a jar and think nobody will maybe look at that till I'm dead. But as long as they'll understand it when they do. Yeah. I, I think we've, we've sort of touched upon now the real purpose of a of a natural history collection and of a natural history museum because i think a lot of us interact with them it's one of these great places where working sort of rock face science comes into contact with the general public and they can sort of be part of that and mingle with it but i think it's really interesting to find out just what a powerful resource they are and just what their enormous purpose is so it's not just a a collection of cool things and it's not a tourist attraction, although both of those things are true, it is really core to, to our science. So could you maybe sum up what is required of a, of a natural history collection? What, it, what is it achieving within science? Well, well funnily enough, I, I made a little list of things today and just leaving science aside for the time being, which we will come back to, there, there is a few other things that it, it does as well. So because a lot of it is so old, there's inevitably a huge historical component to it. So we have things from, you know, Famous expeditions like Challenger from when Charles Darwin went round on the Beagle, even fish going back to Captain Cook's expeditions. So those are interesting historically uh, as well as scientifically. So we occasionally have people coming in looking at them for that reason. And then I think one of my my favorite um, jobs, it doesn't happen that often, is we get artists who want to see something, what it looks like. I had somebody who was doing illustrations for a children's book and uh, wanted to see what some deep sea fish oh, look cool. like. And I love doing that because you then see it through different eyes. You get something out and a scientist will look at it one way, but an artist will see it in a completely different way. But then miscellaneous things that sort of crop up. So for example, quite a long time ago now, we had Speedo swimwear who were very interested in shark skin. And so some of our sharks have got these little sort of squares cut out of them where Speedo swimwear took little <laughs> bits away to sort of analyze to see if they can make a super swimsuit. Even things like crime scene investigations, because, you know, there'll be some bit of evidence that has a little animal in it. And that animal can tell you so much. I mean, I think one of the more macabre things, we had a researcher who came in who was looking at sort of these strange markings that were found in some people who there'd been some terrible plane crash and there were some bodies in the ocean that had been there for some time and they all had these circular wounds on them. So it turned out to be cookie cutter sharks. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's grim. Yeah. So you just you just cannot tell what people are going to... Um... No such thing as an ordinary day. That's wild. <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, I mean, just today, for example, I, I came in, I fed the flesh-eating beetles. Of course. Um, so we have these colonies of beetles that we used to make skeletons, and I've been looking after them. Um, so, yeah, I did that. So then I x-rayed some snake heads for a researcher in India. And then I took two sharks from an extinct species up to the photographer for a researcher in America. So, yeah, every day is, is sort of different. You sort of, <laughs> it's so varied. Yeah, you, you get in, you open up your email, and you just do not know what you're going to expect. I, mean, I think one of my favorite science things is a researcher at, a, at the University of Bath who is incredibly interested in nostrils and uh, the way the fluid moves around inside a fish nostril. And this is something I never, ever thought about at all. And uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating. So you, you get the, the fish's head and you, you do a really, really highly detailed scan of it. And then you recreate the fish's head. You 3D print it and make a little model of the nostril. And then you can put it in a flow tank. The, the idea is that this could be used as a sort of uh, biotechnology to ultimately make some sort of underwater device that can then detect things. And you can make a sort of like an underwater robot that could tell where a, an oil leak is coming from or something like that. But that's the kind of sort of stuff that just comes out of the blue. And uh, it's, a, it's a constant delight to be just continually stimulated with all these interesting novel ideas. You, you get these little glimpses into someone's incredibly specialized, incredibly niche life. And you, oh, yes. you're almost a tourist. You sort of pass through it for a couple of weeks and then you're out the other side Absolutely. and you're, you're back on speedos. Just so many different worlds. I've just got like a tiny little bit of experience. So. My other gushing love for natural history museums is... They are also a collection of incredibly talented people, especially within specific sort of groups of animals. The world experts on particular groups are often behind the scenes in these institutions. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's a, another perk of the job. If I find anything 
I, I know the person to speak to. It's such an amazing privilege to be part of that that world, even just a little bit, and to have a, sort of that knowledge at your basically at your fingertips. One of my favorite stories recently at the museum, which isn't fish related, is with the whale skeleton that we have suspended from the ceiling in our central hall. And they did this fantastic um, study on that where they were looking at isotopes. And you can tell where an animal has been by the isotopes that sort of laid down in its bone. So they could actually see all the places this whale had been in its lifetime. Oh, wow. And, it, and I think, if I remember rightly, it was born near the equator. And then as it grows up, it goes to Antarctica and then comes back again and does its journey like six or seven times. And then it starts to behave quite strangely. And then shortly after that, it gets washed up in Ireland. And then the really tragic thing, and I, I don't know if they've confirmed this or not, but I think another thing they'd be able to pick up from the bones is that it was probably pregnant and that it was maybe moving to, I don't know, it was trying to carve somewhere and then it got into some kind of distress. But things like that, you just wouldn't have thought was, was possible. That is incredible. Like that level of detail from, yeah. I mean, how long has that been dead? That's an old... Oh, I think it's 1900 and something. But yeah, it's, it's over 100 years old. Yeah. I think that's another thing worth touching upon in that there's going to be technology in the future that's going to be telling us more about these old things within the collection there's going to be some new technique that's actually super revealing and having access to a fish from the 1900s is going to be incredibly valuable in ways we can't even imagine right now i, I cannot oh, believe absolutely. they decoded the life of a whale from its very dried very old oh, no. i mean nobody would have predicted the dna stuff and that's been a, a revelation the thing that I'm particularly enjoying at the moment is CT scanning, which is another relatively new thing. And what you can do with that now, the other sort of knock-on thing that you can get from that now, whereas if you find something really interesting, you can then just print it. And the, the idea that at some point we'll be able to just put things online where people around the world can go, well, that's an interesting feature of that specimen, and then just like print it out. So you can be collaborating with someone on the other side of the planet, and they're really interested in this really fragile specimen that will never make the trip. And you can send them a, a digital holotype and they can explore to their heart's content without putting the sample at risk. We may have touched upon it already, but do you have some favorites within the collection? Ooh, um, we've got a really amazing archive at the museum. So a lot of the, the things that we've got have got some um, letters and things that uh, accompany them. I'm quite into Arctic exploration. And there's uh, another two Scottish guys called John Richardson and John Ray, who both been a lots of specimens. And they both went off in search of John Franklin in the to late 1840s. And we've got some of the letters between the two. And so we've got a letter from John Ray to John Richardson. It was written in like 1749. So stuff like that I love. But then when it comes to actual specimens, I think the anglerfish have got to be my favourite. The hairy anglerfish, that's definitely uh, a good one. And we've got a great big football fish, uh, Hermantilophus, and that, that one gets used all the time. And... It brings so much joy as well. So we, we occasionally have sort of like evening events where the public can come in and talk to a scientist and we talk, talk about what we do. And there was one event where I was holding it and somebody said, could I touch that? And I said, okay, well, I've got a big box of gloves here. If you don't mind putting the gloves on, you can, you can hold it. So this is a, a big sort of brown leathery thing about the size of a football. <laughs> Pretty hideous looking with a big branch lure coming out the top of it and these tiny little sort of piggy eyes and lots of teeth. And so this, this person put the gloves on and I handed them the, the football fish and they were just so happy. Yeah, it was a lovely thing to see. We still feel a really personal connection. It doesn't make sense, but it doesn't become real until you can touch it, until you can you can interact with it. And suddenly this alien, totally separate, totally, or let's not even think about that environment, suddenly it becomes very, very personal. I think it's incredibly powerful. And you've obviously experienced that in the room as well. Like the, these people were changed and now they have maybe affinity for the deep sea and they are excited by it. Oh, definitely. And I, I love it when you can reach people and that you suddenly engage them, as you say. And I've occasionally given tools to people who are visually impaired and to give one of them a specimen and then let them sort of experience it. So we had some dried seahorses and I was talking about them and then I sort of handed it to the, this guy. And it, again, that sort of suddenly he could visualize it in his mind, I guess, of what this thing would look like and felt like. It's just great being able to do things like that. That's fantastic. And yeah, it seems so, of course, of course, of course, he, he should have the opportunity to touch that and, and to experience that. That's, oh, I really like that. 
I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Stewart, Assistant Curator of Vertebrates at the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa. We've sailed together a couple of times on the mm-hmm. Kamadic Trench yep. and a lot of the specimens we collected are part of the museum's collection. It's really great just to get this material from the deeper parts. It's just so difficult to get to. It's one hell of a collection. I remember we had a, a little explore around there. You guys have got the Goliath hagfish as well, haven't yes. you? The largest yeah. species of hagfish. Hagfish are fascinating. I, I'm, I have to admit I'm a, a relatively late arriver with hagfish, but the more I've studied them, the more I've come to absolutely love them. They're very good at what they do. They're, they're yes. very well-built fish. <laughs> and they've been doing it for 500 million years. If you Google hagfish slime, you'll see our videos. It's a combination of the slime and the thread. The thread comes out as a tiny little skein about a tenth of a millimeter across, and it unravels to a line about 10 centimetres long. Amazingly, apparently, they never tangle, but as they unravel, they all interweave and and form this dense mat. There is a lot of interest in the thread uh, from a commercial point of view because it's 70% the tensile strength of spider silk, but a much simpler molecule. So possibly it could be synthesized more easily than spider silk. And there is, believe it or not, interest in the slime as a thickening agent in food. Nice. Coming to a yogurt puddle near you. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of those fizzy jelly sweets, which I really like. You know, getting a good mm-hmm. good chew on that, getting a good sort of yeah. bit of resistance. Yeah. I think yeah. I heard about it you've been using clothes as well. If you buy eel skin products, that's hagfish. The brand new scalpel blade will only last about three hagfish. Yes. The skin they is so tough. Gear. They wreck your gear. They're as tough as anything, but they produce the most beautiful, soft, pliable leather. Just north of New Zealand, there is the Kamatic Trench. Bottoms out at just over 10K, I think. I think it was about three or four expeditions in the end to there, and we uh, we all went to sea together as well. And I yes. think it was specimens collected there because we came very familiar with the Kamatic Trench snailfish. So at Yep. Beyond 7,000 meters, there's uh, these lovely booming populations of these cute little snailfish, which I love that the, the toughest fish in the world are so cute and delicate looking. <laughs> and, and later on, it emerged that there were two species present. And the newer species is named after yourself, isn't it? Yes. Yes, that was David Stein at Oregon, who's a snailfish expert. And he, he sent me an email going, hey, I'm going to name this one after you, which is very humbling. It really is. Uh, and most unexpected. Do you have a, a favorite specimen in the collection? Do you have one that either you just have a soft spot for or it's just so immensely cool? I just love the deep sea fish because they have come up with so many bizarre answers to what I call the big three questions of life, which are how do I find a meal? How do I avoid becoming somebody else's meal? And having successfully negotiated those two, how do I find a mate? And it just seems so different to the usual things we see on land and in the shallow waters. There's, seen, there's males and females with the lantern fish. They've got a slightly different configuration of the head photo fours. The work that uh, John Paxton did on the whale fishes, where they found that three different families constituted the juveniles, males and females yes. of one family. So that's like discovering that Mazda's Toyotas and Hondas are in fact all Hondas. It's quite (laughs) incredible. They're completely structurally different, both the sexes and and the juvenile form. Yeah. Yeah, the, the juveniles are called ribbon tails. They've got this ridiculous long caudal filament. The nails are, used to be called big nose fishes. They just look like pug nosed, weird little things. And the females were these gigantic whale fish. Yeah. Many sizes larger than the males. I find these really fascinating. Um, I have a real love of fish, and it's been just such a privilege, really, to work in this field and to have done my life's passion as my job and seen the collection grow by over 450 percent since i started and include such things as the antarctic fauna Uh, we've got this incredible collection now from the southern ocean through good relationships with the seafood industry and the fisheries observers and a couple of expeditions that niwa have mounted on their big ocean going vessel tangaroa which i was part of in 2008 that was just oh i go back tomorrow (laughs) (laughs) Loved it. I just loved it. Yeah, send the gear deeper. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing quite like having the gear come in and just seeing that there's something unusual in there. We were discussing it on a yeah. previous episode that I actually find that quite stressful because uh, you've got to do it justice. You realize how important this specimen is, realize how fragile it is, how quickly you've got to work, you've got to balance 
Am I taking tissue samples? Am I taking photographs? You know, it's breaking down all the time. Yes. And so it's yes. stressful, but it is just wonderfully exciting at the same time. We've managed to, I guess, collect maximum information. Jeremy, my colleague, is, is wanting to start a stable isotope tissue bank. We've got now some 10,000 tissues linked to specimens in the collection. Carl photographs everything. If it's registered, it's tissue sampled. If it's tissue sampled, it's photographed. And this is one of the things that collections are so useful for. So you go back to your old collections and you line things up and you look again. All kinds of new techniques can be applied to old fishes. And it doesn't matter how old they are, so long as they've been well preserved, you can get new information off them. In some cases, sadly, if the fish is extinct in the wild, then um, this is the only source of information. I'm liking seeing the modernization and the layers upon these collections because the, the fundamental unit is still the specimen, it's still the type. And yep. now we can add the layer of a, a CT scan and X-rays yes. and new types of photography and gene sequencing and all that cascades back to it, it's about this library it's about this catalog of traceability down to the type and down to these specifically registered specimens so we were chatting on the last episode about how powerful genetics is but it needs it needs that grounding it needs that anchor and by your collection maintaining here is the specimen here is its genetic code here is an x-ray here is a photograph here is one from 60 years ago and here is one from last week and that continuity is what allows really powerful science to come out of these collections. And being able to identify it in the field, because as much as I might say, where is it? Nobody has actually come up with the handy-dandy pocket DNA analyzing <laughs> yet. So the angler in the field, the, the, the commercial fisherman on the boat, the fisheries officer at the wharf, the fishmonger, they've got to all be able to look at, at something and go, it is this species, it's not that species. And this is a common question and issue that happens everywhere. So these are all tools which help us sort of say, this is what defines species X and how it differentiates it from species A consistently, even though superficially you look at them and go, are they really different? And then you can produce the evidence to say, well, actually, yes, they are quite different. Let me show you. Or even worse, they're like totally different colors. And it's just like, no, no, ignore mm. the color. It's this ray here. If that's longer than that, <laughs> yes. it's this one. <laughs> and you're obsessed with, but this one's spotty and this one's stripy. No, ignore it. It's lying. <laughs> yes. yes, it's just variation. This is the question that taxonomists asked. Is what I'm looking at the difference between species or the variation within species? And often you can't know that easily until you've looked at a lot of material. And certainly DNA is a huge help with that. But at the end of the day, you still have to be able to tell them apart visually. The new techniques don't necessarily supplant the need for collections, for having a specimen in a jar, a drum, a tank, um, whatever. And for scientists to be able to come back again and again and again and look at them, even the oldest ones. Oh, th thanks yep. so much for the chat, mate. So, yes, yeah, so great to hear yeah, from you. Yeah, this was lovely. And, um, I really appreciate yeah. this. We'll stay in touch. was a pressurized version of one of our longer episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full length episode, just match the episode numbers and you'll be able to find the full length version in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time and I abyss you already. On the ride with the